Hello, hello, and welcome to Non Sequitur News for October 9th, 2024. It's season three, episode 283. I am Mayor Watt, and the sentient AI is uh, off on assignment. So I'm doing this as a time machine episode as well as solo. Today, we're going to be talking about uh, No More Lead Pipes, recovered Andy Warhol, documentaries for sale, a museum for film memorabilia. Myers Rum in Buffalo Trace Barrels, a Long Island Mansion, the Waffle House Hurricane Index, I'm not Satoshi Nakamoto either, fish stocks will go nuclear, and Nintendo leans into its new reputation. That and more, powered by hometown.com. Go over and become a citizen and download the podcast and... Follow us on Twitch and YouTube, and uh, there's the Patreon and the Discord. There's TikTok. We're everywhere. All right, so let's get into this. I've got an hour to do this episode, and um, it'll get posted over onto YouTube. It's not going to be posted on Twitch today. And it'll be a podcast as well. So be sure to go and download all of the podcasts. There's six weekly shows and one daily show. So seven total podcasts that are available. Yeah, go check them out. All right. So the very first article is over on the mobile channel. EPA says lead pipes have to be removed in 10 years. When you click the source, it goes straight on over to the hill.com. Rachel Frazen and Zach Budrick put the article together. And yeah, so uh, for whatever reason, uh, it's so dumb. Lead pipes have been installed. And this says about a decade after the Flint water crisis, which I can't believe that it's only been 10 years. It seems like it's been forever. Um, The administration is requiring the removal of most of the nation's lead water pipes within 10 years, mainly because all it takes is a a water chemistry change. And lo and behold, you've got an environmental disaster because the coating that was inside the pipes built up over the years gets shed by some, you know, either. Well, it doesn't really matter why, but the the chemistry changes and the coating is wiped out and you have lead leaching into the water of uh, (laughs) um, adults and children alike. It's just, it's stupid that these pipes were ever put there and willful ignorance has now led them to lead them. Yeah. Led them to stay in place. So exposure can uh, cause brain and nervous system damage in children in adults as well. Let's, be sure of it. In adults, it can lead to reproductive issues, nerve disorders, high blood pressure, memory problems, because the lead actually passes through the blood brain barrier and um, doesn't get removed. So the administration says that it expects to prevent 900,000 infants from having low birth weight, 2,600 children from developing ADHD and other um brain and nervous system related issues and 1500 premature deaths from heart disease each year. And I think that it's understating it. We really don't know just how expansive the damage is, but it's all because of Flint, Michigan and the fact that we've known about lead um, for years and uh, have chosen not to remove them because quote unquote, they're safe as long as you don't mess with the water chemistry. But As Flint shows, that's not true. I mean, Flint messed with the water chemistry. They changed sources. And so at any time, they're not safe. You never know when something bad's going to happen. All right, let's keep moving, though. The next article is over on the Mobile Channel. The FBI recovers an Andy Warhol print worth $175,000 that vanished from a private home in 2021. A man is expected to plead guilty for trafficking the print, which reappeared at a Dallas auction house shortly after it went missing from a California residence. So I guess they're pretty freaking stupid. Ella Feldman is the author over at smithsonianmag.com. And that's the 
Andy Warhol made uh, 46 copies of this print depicting Vladimir Lenin. And it says the maximum sentence for the charge is 10 years in federal prison. As part of his plea agreement, Light will also turn over the stolen artwork recovered by law enforcement as Art News Karen K. Ho reports. So Art News is the actual source, but it's posted at smithsonianmag.com. The stolen Warhol is a gray, yellow, and red screen print depicting former Soviet Union leader Vladimir Lenin. The piece, which was made in 1987, was one of 46 trial proofs. Each one is unique, making them much more one-of-a-kind and valued by collectors. Says CEO of Hamilton Selway Gallery in West Hollywood, who told that to Art News. 25-page plea agreement, for crying out loud. That's insane that there's a plea agreement 20 page, 25 pages long. They said they saw it up for auction for heritage and we let them know that there was a potential problem with the piece. We wanted them to know something was going on here. Despite the warning, Light told the agent that he had purchased the print at a garage sale in Los Angeles for $18,000 in cash. Garage sale? $18,000? Two days later, he emailed law enforcement a fake receipt. So the print is worth an estimated $50,000. So going to jail for 10 years, over 50 grand. Let's move on to the next article. It's over on the Mobile Channel. 3,000 documentaries for just five cents each. Magellan TV's Prime Day offer at a record low price. This actually may have already been abandoned, but uh, we might as well talk about it for a brief moment. I'm not sure if this is going to exist still by the time anybody gets to see this. Gizmodo Deals is what it is um, over at gizmodo.com. 3,000 documentaries at your fingertips. Um, Prime Day, there's a great opportunity for documentary enthusiasts. And since Prime Day is over, this may be as well. The uh, Prime Day special is a golden opportunity for those who missed out on the Labor Day offer. The lifetime subscription grants unlimited ad-free access to Magellan TV's extensive collection, which covers a wide range of topics, including history, science, nature, culture, and more. With new content added weekly, subscribers can continually expand. Huh. I mean, if you really like, uh, if you really like documentaries, then this is your bag. Let's move on. The next article is over in the Technology Today channel at hometown.com, but it's aggregated from uh, GeekWire, I think it is. But let's see, Seattle area, Star Wars collectors among group planning museum for film related memorabilia. Endless Star Wars figures, toys and collectibles fill glass cases in the North Bend, Washington home of Lisa Stevens and Vic Wirtz, who are part of a group that wants to create a public museum dedicated to the sci-fi saga's memorabilia. Or massive collections of Star Wars memorabilia, including two in the Seattle area could come together under one museum roof in a plan that's sure to intrigue geeks across the galaxy. That is a lot of Star Wars figures. So yeah, um, Stevens and Wirtz are longtime collectors who have dedicated much of their home and adjacent warehouse space to displaying and storing their collection. And they, they're joined in the museum by three others, Steve Sansweet, Gus Lopez, Duncan, pardon me, Duncan Jenkins, all of whom want to put together the, the uh, Saga Museum of Star Wars memorabilia. Hmm. We want the Saga Museum to be a place where everyone from hardcore fans to casual visitors can experience the magic of Star Wars in new ways. Rancho, Obi-Wan, President, <laughs> and Newman said in a statement, it's an opportunity to explore how these stories have impacted not just pop culture, but the world at large. Pretty cool. Let's keep going. The next article is, is over in the order of the great channel. We just say order um, of the great, but anyway, 
Myers launches first line of rums finished in Buffalo Trace antique collection barrels. On Wednesday, Myers Rum launched a new lineup featuring the first rums ever finished in the highly coveted Buffalo Trace antique collection or BATC casks. Myers, which was acquired by the Sazerac company in 2018, has leaned into more experimental releases in recent years as the brand aims to revolutionize rum production, similarly how Sazerac did with whiskey. Each of the new expressions features Myers' original dark rum crafted by Sazerac master blender Drew Mayville and are finished in barrels formerly used to age George T. Stagg, William LaRue Weller, and Sazerac Rye 18-year-old Thomas H. Handy Sazerac Rye and Eagle Rare 17-year-old casks. Hey, that's going to look... That's going to look really good on my shelf. Hmm. Uh, I am a pirate at heart, and... Um, I love the idea of this, so I want to try it. So I'm going to have to hunt these down. Olivia White over at vinepair.com put the article together, but they're limited edition, I'm sure. So they're going to be wildly expensive. Maybe. We'll see. So given the varying casts used for finishing, each rum in the series is bottled at varying proofs, with all five delivering unique flavor profiles. The first Myers Rum Signature Cast Collection finishes uh, George T. Stag barrels. Um, in or is said to be the most complex and powerful of the bunch bottled at 100 proof yikes according to the brand the nose is dominated by notes of leather dark molasses charred oak to or coffee not toffee the influence of the barrels used to age the 15 year old barrel proof bourbon is said to be felt on the palate and imparting a dark or a deep brown sugar and dark cherry flavors before a robust finish dun, dun. um there are, this actually breaks down quite a bit. Um, they say that it's going to be $80. Each of the rums in the signature cask will be sold individually and available in limited quantities for a suggested retail price of $80. So yeah, you're looking at $400 worth of rum right there. Yikes. Well, hey. Maybe y'all appreciate it and you'll go and get it. Let's keep moving on though. The next article is over in non sequitur news. It's a business insider, um, real estate article. So they're going to have some really big pictures in here. A 23,000 square foot mansion on long Island's gold coast is on sale for three, $33.5 million. Look inside the home nickname Shangri-La. So when you follow the source, you'll get taken over to wow. I wouldn't call this Shangri-La, but Gabby Shaw over at businessinsider.com put this article together. One DuPont Court, a.k.a. Shangri-La. Brookville has been named one of the most affluent neighborhoods in the United States. The home nicknamed Shangri-La has eight bedrooms and sits on 22 acres of land. This is 21.9, but I round up. The home listed by Daniel Gale Sotheby's. Features two pools, two ponds, eight bedrooms, eight fireplaces, an uh, arboretum, a screened-in porch, almost 22 acres of land. According to the listing, the property's interior space covers more than 23,000 square feet. Yeah, it's pretty expansive. I would not want that in my front yard, though, or backyard, or yard, or anywhere in the neighborhood. But I don't care who it is. I don't want, like, statuary that looks like people. So it is a compound. Wow, look at this thing. I don't know what's back there, but there's like a row of... Oh, there's... It's all of these little windows. Huh. Anyway, very natural looking pond in the back. Yeah, it looks really nice. A lap pool and a regular pool. Or conventional pool. A 70-foot lap pool is off the home's primary bedroom and has its own cabana. And some serious fencing, like, on top of the pool. Wow. Second pool, which is 70 feet by 30 feet, is next to two more cabanas. One of one has a full catering kitchen and the other has two bedroom or bathrooms, dressing rooms, and an outdoor shower. There's also a waiting pool with a fountain. 
Now, see, this is up in Long Island, New York, though. So, and it has four seasons and I just, I am, I don't like snow anymore. I don't want snow. Uh, the listing agent Sandy Binder or Binder of Daniel Gale Sotheby's told Business Insider that in her decades of experience, it's one of the most beautiful homes she's ever seen on North Shore of Long Island. Yeah, it looks pretty. I like it. Let's keep going. Oh, interesting. Hmm. I swear I've seen this house before, but maybe not. Primary bedroom. That is the new look or the new term, by the way. Hmm. Tub's a little ostentatious, but I'm not really, I, I don't really care for that style. But, you know, if you can spend $33 million, you can swap it out. Formal sitting room features a fireplace, one of eight throughout the home and its cabanas. That is a huge open, just it's called a formal sitting room. It, you're definitely just sitting around. And then another sitting room that has two separate tables. <laughs> wow. All right. Well, there's more. Um, they say here in Brookville itself, you'll find yourself near the Americana Man uh, Manhasset, commonly known as the Miracle Mile, which is home to high-end shops. Yeah, terraced yards. That's intriguing. All right. Let's move on. Probably the opposite of the spectrum is a Waffle House that has its own hurricane index and storm center. Milton is code red, and here's what that means. So common sense would tell you the tell you Floridians concerned about Hurricane Milton would turn to the news and um, the Federal Emergency Management Agency to stay informed about the storm's impact. But there's a third source that many in the South are using that may come as a surprise, and that's the Waffle House. Waffle houses are in the path of Hurricane Milton are shutting down a telling story of the severity of the storm. Ben Castlin over at QuartzQZ.com put the article together. Um, let's see here. Let me pause that. So the chain itself or the chain prides itself on being open when its customers need it most, but in particular vulnerable to hurricanes with most of its locations in the Gulf Coast, Florida, South and Mid-Atlantic saying, uh, said it fully embraced its post-disaster business strategy after Hurricane Katrina when seven restaurants were destroyed and dozens were shut down. Today, Governor Brian P. Kemp had the opportunity to visit a Waffle House storm center as they continue to recover from Hurricane Helene and prepare for Hurricane Milton. Thank you to the Waffle House operations team for your great work to prepare and inform the public during times like this. So they have their own scale, I think, as well. Now, sales often double or triple in the aftermath of a storm. The company said it tries to be as prepared as possible for hurricanes so it can keep the community or help the community. If you factor in all of the resources we deploy, the equipment we lease, the extra supplies trucked in, the extra manpower we have in place, a place for them to stay, you can see we aren't doing it for the sales those restaurants generate. Pat Warner, a member of the Waffle House crisis management team, said on the company's website. Yeah, they have a storm index. If you get there and the Waffle House is closed, that's really bad. That's where you go to work. So Waffle House is labeled uh, Milton, a category four storm as a code red, which means the company has closed its locations in the path of the storm. A yellow rating means that the location will have a limited menu and the area might not have power. A green means that the store is operating as normal. So pretty much right where it landed, they had put out uh, red uh, designations for the stores or for the restaurants. Yep. And it actually made land as a cat three. So although this is a time machine episode, 
Okay, let's keep moving. Uh, the next article is over on the Hatch Ideas channel. Man denies being mysterious inventor of Bitcoin, known as Satoshi Nakamoto. Um, this uh, this trying to find out who the owner is is actually or the creator is is um, quite fascinating because there's one person who has claimed to be it and can't prove it, and another person who has been identified as but says no, I'm not it. But this is somebody different than either of those two as far as i know joe tidy over at bbc.com put this article together this is peter todd i guess that's what's named here in the article a new documentary claims to have solved the great mystery of cryptocurrency the true identity of the bit uh, the inventor of bitcoin the question has captivated the internet since the digital currency was launched back in uh 2009 calling themselves satoshi nakamoto Now, the makers of HBO films say they have finally answered that question. A Canadian crypto expert named Peter Todd. But Peter Todd has dismissed it as ludicrous and criticized the documentary. In fact, they could have a lawsuit um, available to them because they're naming somebody who is not and can't be proven to be that person. And if they suffer in some way, because somebody <laughs> somebody believes they are who they are. Well, who the documentary says they are. So, and, and the reason why I say it like this is if the person cashes out the Bitcoin wallet that still exists, um, that was used to seed the initial uh, issuance of Bitcoin, they'd be worth about $70 billion dollars and instantly be catapulted to the 20th richest person in the world. Peter Todd is a prominent Bitcoin developer and has been credited with many innovations in the world's first and largest cryptocurrency. But he has never previously been named as a prime Satoshi candidate in the years that spent that people have spent trying to unmask the Bitcoin inventor. I know of two, and like I said, one has never been able to prove that they are, and the other one says that they aren't. Colin Hoback, who has previously attempted to unmask anonymous online figures like Q from QAnon, says he came to the conclusion after years of research and interviews. It shouldn't be a conclusion, bub. I mean, if somebody says they are, then yeah, they have to prove it. But you can't out somebody who doesn't want to be named as Satoshi Nakamoto. For crying out loud, it's just so... I think it should be illegal, but the person isn't doing anything criminal. They're just leading their life. So I don't know. I think that that, this kind of shit should be illegal. So leading theory is that Satoshi deliberately destroyed access to his massive stash of Bitcoins that were the originals created to start Bitcoin. The 1.1 million coins are now worth a fortune, but have never been spent or transferred. Satoshi's stash is unmoved coins represents 5% of all Bitcoin. And the inventor decided that there would only ever be 21 million coins created. But it's um, infinitely divisible. You can just drag the decimal further and further away, just like the dollar does. We don't operate at just pennies. Now we have fractions of pennies. Always have. Yeah, I just think that it's really bad. They talk about past... um, theories as well but you can follow the link through hometown it'll be in the show notes on youtube and the podcast but it's not going to be available on twitch not this one um but we haven't missed a day yet and i'm not about to but i won't be able to do the show um i wasn't able to do the show on the 9th and i won't be able to do the show on the 10th i don't think and um So let's keep on moving. The next article is over in Hatch Ideas. A nuclear plant will decimate fish stocks. The company building it accepts fish will be killed in its system, but wants to create new habitats. Uh, Dave Harvey over at BBC.com put the article together. And it says there's people that are protesting that have a sign that says hedgehogs live here, save our homes. So how many fish does a nuclear power station kill? It sounds grisly, but for engineers in the Somerset coast, building Britain's first nuclear power station in a generation, it's an urgent question. 
for con conservationists and local villagers on the banks of the river S Severn, uh, or Severn, um, in Gloucester, it has become such an urgent question. They filled a village hall to debate it. So proposals for the seawater cooling system at Hinkley point C will see 44 tons of fish ingested and killed every year. 44 tons. Um, I wonder if there would be a way to remedy that. We already have lost 80% of our salmon and half of the salmon that get into Hinkley's cooling system will be destroyed. The scheme will decimate fish stocks. At the heart of this row is a um, simple truth of physics. Nuclear power plants by design get hot. The steam drives enormous turbines which whiz around and generate electricity at Hinkley Point. They're about to install the nuclear reactor which will create all the heat in the first place. It's generating some heat before it even gets installed. It's still at least seven years before it will be switched on. But first, they need to think about the fish. So, yeah. So, I guess it's an estimate. They don't really know, right? Fast incoming tides and quicksand. Beware. Interesting. So can they stop the fish? Engineers have done plenty of things to save the fish, including fitting a complex concrete head to the pipes on the uh, seabed where the water comes in. Narrow side vents allow water in with grills to keep larger creatures out. Unlike previous power stations, it's not just an open pipe sucking in water, but they accept some fish will get through. Yeah, well, it'll be a problem, but I don't know. We need power and... Uh, Maybe they're, you know, maybe they can incubate fish somewhere else and offset this loss. Uh, it might be, you know, significant, but man, we really do need power and nuclear power is the only one that generates enough power um, without the need of solar, which is a hot mess as well. And, um, inefficient so he said salt marsh salt marsh reduces flooding it provides shelter and breeding grounds for fish it's an amazing place for birds and great for people mr cockruff uh, who runs the public engagement program for hinkley point said salt marshes are a natural compensation for the nuclear uh, plant's impact and these salt marsh habitats will have salmon eels countless marine species will be able to breed they basically want to just flood a new area. And this this gathering at a village hall is like just so old school. Maybe I mean it's standard in, um, in the UK or but um, I love that, you know, that there's it's a, a relatively small townhome meeting and they all meet and what amounts to a pub outside of a, a, you know, a pub was the location for people to discuss things uh, back in the day, still do, but it was like the formal setting um, outside of the village hall. So as the name suggests, a system of loudspeakers near the inlet pipes would simply scare fish away. They call it an acoustic fish deterrent. I guess it depends on what they play. And if the fish like the music or not. Anyway, some people are really upset, but I have a feeling it's the people that don't want things to change. And well, yeah, <laughs> we're the dominant species. Okay. There's more over here at this article. Um, again, go check it out. It's by Dave Harvey over at BBC.com. The next article and the last one for the Time Machine episode um, is in the Warcrafter channel. Nintendo is shedding its veneer of kindness and embracing a new reputation. Pain in the ass. No, uh, vigorous legal bully. We're experiencing a golden, a golden age of Nintendo's legal bloodhounds. Seriously. These days, I hear more about Nintendo's latest target of annihilation than Nintendo's latest video games. That's partly because the console giant's recent output has mostly been a forgettable roster of late generation call-ups like Zelda spinoff and more Mario Party. 
um, and you know another Pokemon this and Pokemon that, but it's not any better, or more evolved, or anything like that. Um, and frankly, I don't like what Nintendo does to content creators that, uh, for lack of a better term, utilize um, the Nintendo property, but it is it's a byproduct of playing the game. It's a byproduct of utilizing the stuff. Um, and it's nine times out of 10 doing it's positively spun. So I don't know why content creators are getting shut down all the time. Um, like I understand certain things, emulators, for instance, that basically allow somebody to just make a copy of a game that they don't have. Um, and I mean, it's pirating, but you know, they even go after people that just mention Nintendo. Hell, I'm surprised that I'm not going to get busted when I click this link. So the, the, the article is over at pcgamer.com. Morgan Park put the article together. Nintendo is speed running the Disney playbook and we all know where that goes. Yeah. Regret, regret, regret backpedaling and changing and fixing things that they shouldn't have ever done. Like a contract for a sir or an agreement, a terms of your use agreement that binds somebody to arbitration when their wife dies of food poisoning or an allergic reaction, I should say, should say. So, um, beyond that one month that we were all really into tears of the kingdom, the story of Nintendo lately is one of picking fights, threatening to sue its own fans so hard that they don't even dare fight back. Yeah. So between late 2022 and 2024, Nintendo went after a PC application, barrage YouTuber, uh, with copyright strikes, blocked the release of the dolphin simulator emulator on steam by warning valve. It had come after them indirectly killed a cool portal 64. It says D make. I don't know if that's supposed to be remake in development for genuine N64 hardware. Amazingly valve nipped this one in the bud, not because of the portal usage, but because it didn't want to deal with the inevitable Nintendo fallout. It DMCA'd PAL World Pokemon mod. It sued the developers of the Yuzu Switch emulator. It killed the Citra 3DS emulator. It nuked 20 years worth of Nintendo related Gary's mod creations. It formally filed a patent lawsuit against PAL World and it sicked the dogs on the last Switch emulator standing Ryu Jinx, which from what I hear, they actually sent agents to somewhere in South America um, to personally confront the emulator uh, developer. So I don't know. I think Nintendo is just being an asshole, but hey, that's me. Anyway, there is more over at this article and um, thanks Morgan Park for putting that little rundown. I'm sure that there's stuff in between this uh, that Nintendo has gone after people without a doubt. I just, you just know it. And I suspect that I'll probably get a notice right after I publish this to YouTube. Okay. But with that in mind, I'm going to emulate my way right back to the front page of hometown.com and look, it's the ninth because we're in a time machine. Ah. But that's it. We're out. I'm going to um, shut down and then uh, maybe I can get the uh, October 10th episode in, but I don't know. I've got mayoral duties that I need to attend to. So I'll see you in a little bit. And uh, maybe the sentient AI will be here as well. So see you soon. Bye bye. Mm -hmm.